I definitely try to obviously lead by example. And I think like that's the most impact I've had. It's like, dude, you can come at me and, and tell me like I'm soft because I don't eat meat, but come work out with me. And one of us is going to leave in a body bag and it's not going to be me. What's up, friends, dudes, dudettes, awoken dudes, if you will. Welcome to my corner of the internet, where I'm sitting on my couch next to my dining room table, which is where I was sitting when I had the distinct pleasure of talking to today's guest. Today's guest is Pat McCauley. He is a public speaker whose TED Talk just moments before this conversation was recorded hit 1 million views. Pat's talk was centered around the effects of switching to a 100% plant-based lifestyle. In college, Pat was the quarterback. He played for his football team. By the time he'd graduated from college, his doctor told him that he had the knees of an 80-year-old man. His arthritis was that bad. Pat also had a lifetime dealing with allergies. He was asthmatic. After Pat switched to a plant-based lifestyle, he has now ditched his inhaler and he no longer carries an EpiPen. In addition to the topics I just covered with you, Pat and I also do a deeper dive on what it means to truly be an alpha male and what it's like and what it means to be an agent of change within your family and community. If you like this podcast, please consider sharing it with a friend because I know through the power of the internet, I have drastically and radically changed my life. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here with you, sharing to you people that I find interesting and sharing with you information that has truly helped my life. Without any further ado, Pat McCauley. Congratulations, Pat McCauley, on uh, reaching a million views on TED Talk. That was a cool thing to tell my kids this morning. When they're like, who are you talking to? I was like, he has a million views. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's still it's still pretty wild to me, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, it's been cool. That's awesome. Um, so I would imagine the people that I know that are going to listen to this, um, they will probably go and watch the TED Talk. But I would imagine they haven't seen it yet. So if you could, um, without doing the whole speech all over again, kind of like surmise what that uh, what you talked about in your TED Talk. Yeah, I mean, I just really talked about my honest path with specifically, you know, what I put into my body and how it's in, impacted my health, how it's impacted my life, my relationships. And, um, yeah, I come from a very, uh, sports oriented background and, you know, played college football. And it was just what I was always told was, you know, quote unquote, high protein. Right. Mm -hmm. And all through the nineties, early two thousands, when I was playing, you know, that meant eggs for breakfast, chicken for lunch, steak for dinner. It meant high animal product. And um, that's really what I followed in whey protein shakes. And it was always like protein, protein, protein was like the center. And, and again, that meant animal products. And, um, you know, I was super jacked and super fit and really good athlete and trained my ass off and all that. But, you know, I had all these things on the side that came with that from allergies to asthma, to skin problems, to, you know, all these bodily issues, um, that I thought and, and was told by anyone I asked any doctor, any nutrition, whatever, was just kind of normal things I had to live with my whole life. And, you know, they're just normal, right? My experience was always like, here's what you got. You know, you go to the doctor, it's like, oh, you have asthma. Here's your inhaler. You know, you want to take this this time of day and this many times a week and when you go to practice and you know bring it and take it then like it was never like you can actually address those things um and the flip side of that was like i was always told i was a healthy kid right i was always always in great shape always active so it was kind of like oh you're doing great you're eating great you know you're in great shape um you have these problems send me on my way and um you know, it wasn't until I started experimenting that with that after my sports days that, you know, I realized that at least I felt like I had been lied to my whole life, you know. Um, but I just realized that the people I trusted had the wrong information um, and know very little about human health and only know about kind of treating uh, problems and managing uh, problems. So, my path into a plant-based diet was really through experimentation because I wasn't feeling good. I wanted to try a different way. I had always followed the same thing um, my whole life and it was just leading to more and more problems. So um, I stumbled into a plant-based diet and within six months, 
you know, all those things that I had carried EpiPens for and inhalers for just started going away. And that was really the aha moment and why I now do dedicate my life to, you know, talking about it and, and giving people the ability, hopefully to incorporate more plants into their diet. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, I talk a lot about also in that talk, uh, what that does to you personally from like an empathetic and compassionate, uh, point of view and being able to connect with the people in your life, um, on a much deeper level because, because of that. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, man, I, I just shared my journey and it's cool that people related to it and I got it across in a way that impacted some people. Uh, what, what sports were you playing and, um, maybe touch on, the reaction from some of your peers when you came out as a, a vegan. That's a funny way to put it. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I, whatever you call yourself. I was, um, at the time I was playing college football. Um, I played, played quarterback in college and, um, yeah. So like a very like man's man sport and was like 185 pounds at the time. Um, and yeah, it wasn't until post football, but I still had the same kind of crew around me at the time. Like when I started doing it, I was working as a, as a trainer, which was one of my first jobs out of college, um, you know, training other athletes, uh, for their college sports. And, um, yeah, the, the reaction was, um, you know, people were just kind of like intrigued by it. I can't say it was like negative, obviously, uh, some people reacted in a way that, you know, I guess normal d- closed minded dudes would. Um, but I mean, for the most part, it was just like, Oh, that's interesting. Um, I can't say like it was super negative. It was just kind of the normal, like guy jokes. Um, yeah. So it, it was more just, they didn't know what they didn't know. And it was kind of joking and, uh, they certainly didn't think seven years later, I'd still be doing it. I can tell you that much. Yeah. I talk a lot about being the agent of change in your group, especially with your family, because unless you sever ties from your family, you, um, you're going to have an ongoing relationship with them. So if people aren't making positive changes around you, you can kind of be that. Uh, have you had anyone convert since you've taken this journey and it's been like seven years now? Have there been people that have followed suit? What does that look like with the dynamic with your, your set of peers that you've had the whole time? Yeah. I mean, most of my peers I've had the whole time. I mean, I have like one or two super close friends that are definitely vegan now. Um, and then my family, my family's been interesting. Um, I'm one of eight kids. Uh, so there's like a lot of things going on. Um, but you know, my mom right away, um, you know, her, her, actually my, my first ever podcast episode was with my mom. Um, I convinced her to do like six weeks plant-based and then we, we talked about it and that's kind of how my podcast started. Um, but she like, you know, we were whole food plant-based. We walked every day for six weeks and it was just incredible, like down 20 pounds. Like we had our blood work done before and after, like it was just night and day, like things that you don't think will normalize going plant-based like B12 and like iron levels, like all those got better. Um, so it was just super cool, like showing her that, um, Mm -hmm. and she felt amazing and was, you know, not taking certain things that she was taking medication wise and things like that. And, um, yeah, so mom was kind of the first, um, and then it's trickled out. A lot of siblings do it. Um, a lot of them are kind of like 90% and they still will have their days where they kind of don't do it. Um, but I think they all know, like if they, are not feeling well or they're, they're sick. Like they know what they need to default back to. Mm -hmm. Um, although I think a lot of them struggle to follow it all the time, but it has definitely trickled out in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, I want to talk to you about your recovery. Did you notice, and I'm sure you did, but can you talk about like what recovery has been like for you, um, in the athletic world post being plant-based? Cause like personally, I've noticed a huge thing in that Pat. Like I struggled with plantar fasciitis, to a point where everyone told me that I would have to just quit running. And then I switched to being completely hundred percent plant-based. And like, I started to feel it coming on the other day and I just kind of like stretched and like took it easy. And two days later, like I woke up, like I felt like Wolverine kind of, 
I was like, man, I'm like recovering so quickly. No, I I mean, a hundred percent. And having been like an athlete, um, you know, on a high meat diet and an athlete on a plant-based diet, like it is just night and day. You know, I was told, um, by a doc. So I, I tore like a bunch of stuff in my knee, um, my, my last year playing college football. And I was told like the first year after that I had like the knees of an 80 year old, you know, like the arthritis of a, of an 80 year old and in this knee that I had torn up. Right. And, you know, now I'm doing Ironmans and it's just like, that is not possible without changing what I put in my diet, uh, put, put in my body. And the recovery is just insane. And anybody who's really fully committed to it, um, that doesn't feel that, I think they don't have like the right connection with their body because I, I can only speak for myself, but it has been night and day in terms of recovery. And just the biggest thing I've noticed coming from somebody who used to have asthma is just the ability to breathe. Like I, you know, the, the few weeks into like whole food plant-based, I went out for a run and man, I felt like I could breathe for the first time in my life. And it's yeah. just so beautiful. And I'll, I'll be on a, you know, running a trail race or, or doing a triathlon or something. And I'll be running, you know, a, a six, six thirty mile next to someone and they're breathing heavy. And I'm like, it, it's like I'm walking, like just the, uh, the lack of inflammation and ability to breathe it, it is incredible. Um, so that's what I would say I've noticed the most. I, I remember cause I'm still a, a newbie, which all of my, um, vegan friends have done it for a long time. Some of them like to remind everybody John's new to this, <laughs> even though I was like vegetarian 10 years ago and I was like eating nothing but cheese, like sandwiches and stuff. But I remember like three or four weeks into plant-based and running and calling my friends. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? And they're like, well, we tried. <laughs> and I get called an evangelist sometimes, but it really truly is life changing. And I wish more people like I'm, I, it's amazing to hear that you got your mom to do it for six weeks. I wish more people would just try it to be like, look, <laughs> you're going to feel like you've been lied to your whole life, especially like by the dairy industry. It's completely, completely mind blowing. Um, plant pub, the hat that you're wearing. Yes, sir. All of the food looks amazing. And I, you know, I didn't even know that you were a part of Plant Pub. I didn't know that it was your thing. I didn't really understand necessarily a lot about you. But when I saw you say something about fuck the haters, I was like, I need to talk to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have a mutual friend. Um, I think R- Remy B Real is his Instagram handle. Yeah, yeah. And I needed a third person. I was like, this is the guy. I started diving into it more and more. And um, I follow a lot of like, like rich roles and a lot of people like plant-based athletes. But it's very hard to find someone that's like, openly um, embracing like pub food and drinking beer. Can you kind of like talk about like being a, I'm assuming you, you're a beer guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have been in craft beer was kind of one of uh, a craft brewery here in Boston was one of my previous ventures. And um, I do love that world and, and I love the community around it and how welcoming, welcoming it is for so many different types of people. I think something like craft beer does well is like it, it's one of the few places like at a brewery or a concept that revolves around it wh- where you'll see the the 21 year old right next to the 60 year old and you'll see families and you'll see dogs and it's just a very welcoming atmosphere and plant pub really like I'm not trying to obviously be a health food concept I recognize and I tell people all the time like you know going to plant pub like every day is not going to like change your health situation. You know, we Mm -hmm. make plant-based comfort food, but what I've noticed, especially with friends and family and, and being somebody that people often reach out to for like, you know, plant-based advice is if people have to sacrifice like their one night out with their spouse, or they have to, you know, uh, be a pain in the ass at the restaurant and ask for specific things to be plant-based. And, um, you know, they have to sacrifice their social lives and all these, you know, the one night a week that they love, then they're not going to, they're really not going to stick with it. And then also being a guy previously who um, was that prototypical meat eater who was turned off by 
like the hippie granola plant-based uh concepts with buddhas on the walls and like i did i want to know part of that and that's maybe why like i didn't go plant-based sooner because i was that typical guy that like was not open to that and thought it was like just weird shit right so i really wanted to create a concept where like it it's totally approachable like it breaks down the the barrier to entry right and if you can get kind of like the average you know blue collar bostonian here to feel comfortable walking in for a hundred percent plant-based burger and a beer like maybe that just opens them up enough to rethink the way they eat right but yeah. otherwise if it, you know if we're a juice bar or we're a salad bar you know we don't we don't get that customer um but also myself as like a super healthy dude like i still love on friday night a burger and a beer with friends you know um that that's something that i, I don't plan on giving up anytime soon um you know that that kind of one, once in a while thing uh, with friends and family that I think is important to connect with people and everything. So I just wanted to create a plant-based concept that is approachable to everybody. Um, and I'm not trying to replace your green smoothie or, or your whole food plant-based meals. It's, it's really just to welcome people in, uh, if they're kind of interested in it. Um, but also, um, obviously there's other benefits to not having a regular burger and a beer. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the animal in, in planetary impact. So if you're going to go out for a burger and a beer and we can make it, you know, not only a little better for you, but way better, uh, you know, for the world, like, why wouldn't you have that burger and burger and beer, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You've touched base on ethics with animals enough. Like, and whenever I look up any talks that you've done or just by following you, um, you want to? Can you talk about that? I guess what it's like to be a, a guy that's compassionate, and you kind of in your TED talk too. You talked about um, you noticed having more patience with your, I think, it's girlfriend at the time. I don't know if she, she's your wife, but you're, you're you talked about having like a, a newfound sense of calm listening to your partner. Can you kind of like talk, talk about that for a second? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, kind of how I explain it in the talk is kind of with uh, with, with cellular memory, which is a uh, a concept really, really what I was trying to get at. Um, and that's, that's the one piece of the talk that I did like receive a bunch of shit, uh, for from like, again, people that aren't super open-minded. Um, but really what I was trying to, <laughs> really what I was trying to get at is like, you know, the, the physics of, of what we eat and the fact that everything is energy and that really can't be denied. That is science, that's physics. And, um, you know, Einstein said, you know, energy doesn't dissipate, it transfers. Mm-hmm. And when we consume something, there is a transfer of energy from the thing we consume to us. We're putting that in our body for, uh, for, for many people with, with uh, animal products, it's, it's more than 24 hours. You know, you're putting something in your body for, for days. Um, and there's a real transfer of energy there. And if you're consuming something that you know, is lived a very stressful, um, life, you know, you are taking on that. And at least for me with, with my experience, once that stuff was out of my diet and not going in my body, um, there was this just sense of calm and kind of peace within me, as opposed to this like stress and anxiety and, um, you know, quick, quick reactive, um, kind of way that I had always been. I just felt more better able to connect with the people around me. Um, and I also think when you start thinking about what you put on your plate and you think of the impact of that and you do look at animals as a being and not a piece of meat, there's just a natural, like I'm considering other things and there's just a new perspective of, um, empathy and compassion that comes with that as well. So it's kind of the two things. It's getting the the dis-ease, as I call it, out of your body, um, but also just a, a whole new perspective on how you kind of look at things. You're taking in, into account other things in your life other than yourself. And that, that trickles out to um, everything in your life. Obviously, if you become more compassionate towards animal beings, you kind of naturally 
have more compassion for the people in your life too. Um, and that really changes things. Yeah, it really does, Pat. Done. A, I, don't, I think it was probably a clip from your podcast, but you had talked with a, a guy, and I cannot remember his name, but you talk, uh, the title of the video was uh, You Can Be an Alpha or Alphas Are Vegans. And it, it really is, in my opinion, one of the most alpha things you can do to be like the protector, you know? Like to go in and destroy everything is kind of like um, sociopathic a little bit. And I still hesitate to touch base on that subject publicly because like you said, you get shit for it. The most shit I get on Instagram from strangers, and I have like sub 500 followers. So very little reach outside of my network of people. But the second I start talking about, like I'll show my dog and I'll be like, just a reminder, your lunch is smarter than this thing. Uh, people, <laughs> people are so mean about it. And it kind of breaks my heart in a little bit, uh, a little bit, man, especially like we've been sl slow to like convert our kids because my son goes to see his mom in Florida during the summer and my daughter is with her dad half the time. But my son will just be like, I don't care. And it makes me so sad. It's like, you can care, but be a strong dude. Like I even hes hesitate to like say alpha because I feel like that's maybe, I hear people use it in the wrong context all the time, but I've been more comfortable using alpha as a way to describe myself or leader since I switched to like being more compassionate. So thank you for being a beacon. Like, of that like do you do you feel like a beacon do you feel like a leader is that like what you're trying to do i don't know man i, I mean i really just try to like speak what i think and and i definitely try to obviously lead by example and i think like that's the most impact i've had it's like dude you can come at me and, and tell me like i'm soft because i don't eat meat but come work out with me and one of us is going to leave in a body bag and it's not going to be me yeah. And it's just like, like if I'm the, if I'm the example on that front, like, like, what are you, what are you trying to convince me that I'm, I'm lacking that, you know, makes, makes me not, uh, again, to use that word, like alpha or manly or whatever. Like if I can be an example on that front, not that like, I really enjoy that, but I, I just know that that's where I can relate to kind of that man's man. It's like, dude, come do an Ironman with me, you know? Yeah. It, like, if you're going to, like, come at me, like, you know, like, what what about me is not alpha if you can't hang with me? You yeah. know, so, like, I try to be an example on that front, but I also often say, like, it takes zero courage to, like, you know, continue doing what you've always done. And it takes zero courage to just, you know, mindlessly consume you know, so like, you know, I think being a part of a man, uh, be, being a man is like being courageous and, um, you know, do not doing the popular thing and like having the balls to speak your mind and speak what you feel. Right. And so I think to just mindlessly consume and not consider anything else is just like a cowardly thing to do. Um, so I think it's exactly like the opposite. Why does me unnecessarily killing and consuming like an unarmed you know being that can't defend itself how is that like a manly thing to do right yeah if a lion's coming at you that's going to tear you apart like okay you you kill it right that's i understand that but like that is not the food we consume so yeah man i, I think it's exactly the opposite it takes strength it, it ta takes courage to um, you know, make the compassionate decision. And I think that's manly. That is, if, if you had to, if you were like, John, imagine a perfect response from Pat today. I would have thought of something close to that, but nowhere near as, as good as that, man. It really, maybe I'm drawn to talking to people because I want reassurance because for me, transitioning was really hard, especially with uh, my father-in-law. Like he was so mad at me. Like didn't want to talk to me. <laughs> It's like a big meat guy and he's like, your ribs, I loved your ribs. And what are we going to do for dinner? I'm like, dude, we, you don't ever eat the same thing as me anyway. Like we'll still have an experience together. Yeah. But, yeah. To, but to have you and like, to, like, I respect you. And, um, I think maybe I look up to you. Um, I, I feel like that's weird to say because we're similar in age and we're peers and we're both like doing our own things in business in the world. 
but I kind of look up to you. So it's like really awesome to have you say something that's like so reassuring. It makes me feel confident to continue going into the world. So thank you. hundred percent, man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, you've talked about your, your epic morning routine. I've seen that <laughs> maybe a couple of years ago, but you talk about breath work and meditation. Are you still doing that? And do you think about Buddhism at all when you're thinking about living your life? Yeah, I can't say I, uh, I think about Buddhism. Um, I grew up very Catholic in a very like strict Catholic household. Um, I like to say I'm a, I'm a recovering Catholic, uh, <laughs> because yeah. I don't really, uh, relate to it very much, but, um, yeah, I, I am kind of like, you know, whatever you want to call it, God, universe, whatever. I, I absolutely believe in a higher power. Um, and I believe that we can create our, our own future. And I think, you know, there's, there's that force always working in our favor. And that's kind of like where my beliefs stem from. Again, I don't care what that's called. Um, I know it's there and it's, it's, it's a big part in my life. And I think it's always conspiring for me and helping me and um, with me. Um, but yeah, the, the breath work and the meditation, uh, specifically the, the breath work, um, I do every day. Um, even if I don't have my, if I have a hectic morning and I can't do my normal, like lay on my yoga mat and do it, like, um, doing it in the car as I'm, you know, driving in to plant pub or, or wherever I'm going. And, um, that's something I don't miss. And I think there's like incredible health benefits to that. Um, just oxygenating your body. Um, I've had a lot of amazing conversations on my podcast and something that stuck with me and something I've heard from like a number of healers is the idea that oxygen heals all and, and disease cannot exist in an oxygenated environment. And we go, we go, most people go our whole lives without, you know, tapping into what is, I would argue the most powerful healing tool you can use, which is your own breath. Um, yeah, man. So I, I'm huge on it. And if I have uh, the time in, in the morning, that leads right into a meditation. I think the breath work kind of puts you in a great place mm -hmm. to then meditate. And I kind of use meditation as um, a means to like kind of fire myself up. And like I envision... Uh, my future self and I envision myself kind of accomplishing the things I want to accomplish, um, whether that's opening plant pubs or it's, you know, taking my family on a vacation or like I have a, a, a whole list of things um, that I envision. And when I get up from that, not only do I get the health benefits of all, all the breath, but I wake up as that person that just, that is that like, thing I'm aiming for in the future and I feel closer to it and I feel energized and I feel uh, reminded of why I do what I do every day. That's amazing. You're a man that's true to your word too. Um, I went through your comment section on YouTube <laughs> and three weeks ago I screenshot you talking to a guy that was, uh, he was talking about how he had a, a, like an injury and was trying to come back and you like recommended breath work to him, vis visualization. And he said, tell yourself you're going to recover way faster than what is normal. And you're like talking about the mind being powerful. So to like see you taking the time just to say that to someone that's engaging with you too, was like super epic. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah. The, 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 the body fo uh, follows what the, what the mind, uh, thinks, man. I mean, the body follows the mind and it starts, it starts up here. You know, if you, 100%. if you don't believe you're, you can heal, you're not going to heal. If you don't believe you can accomplish X, you're not going to accomplish X. I mean, it's as simple as that. Dude, for sure. I spent a lot of time on dating apps when I was single and there's always these questionnaires and usually they ask about religion and it always blew my mind that people would say they didn't believe in religion, but they, and then they also didn't believe in prayer. Cause like I went through a phase where I was like super into punk rock and like very like, like loud about being an atheist, but I always believed in the power of prayer. I'm like, how is there no one else out there that's like, thinks that you don't have to like visual a deity, but you can also have that, but then believe in the power of your mind. Um, totem man. Yeah. Yeah. Totem. Man. I could go uh, down a rabbit hole there, but I, I but I'll save yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This isn't philo philosophy. It could be, but, uh, 
you know, I don't want to take up too much more of your morning. I want to ask you one more question and then we'll wrap up. But um, you have this like very, and it sounds like it's intentional. It's like very approachable way of being plant-based and being vegan. And you did a day of you eating. And I actually watched that right before this interview, but you were like, fuck the macros. And I get asked about this a lot, especially my friends that are like fitness coaches. They're like, how much protein are you getting? Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, I didn't know that before. Like, I just, I know that if I eat like trash before I go and do like a long run, I'm going to feel like trash and it's going to be harder. So maybe if you can touch base on that, because I think that may help anyone that listens to this be like, okay, I don't have to be a scientist to, to become plant-based or to like pay attention to like my diet. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think the way we look at food in terms of macros is just wrong, right? Um, you know, I got to a point where it was like, why am I eating animal products? And the only reason I was eating animal products was because of that word protein. And this idea that to be healthy and fit, we should follow a high protein diet. And that just isn't accurate, right? If you ask somebody like, everybody's worried about protein, right? But nobody in the Western world lacks protein, right? So, and you can even make the argument that the more protein in your diet, the more disease as well. So it's like more protein is worse and there's no like blue zone or any long living healthy population that eats a high protein, high animal based diet and is like disease free and lives long. So it's like this thing that we put on the pedestal and everybody wants all of it. But when you really look at it, it just means you're going to, you know, end up in the grave faster. So why are we going towards this thing that is just making us sicker? Um, but also if you ask somebody like nobody knows how much protein they should get, it's like, you're going to tell me I need to start eating protein, but you don't even know how much you should get. And nobody, as long as you're consuming some reasonable amount of calories, it's literally impossible to be deficient in protein. Um, so the way we look at food with macros is just, is just wrong. It's like, okay, eggs are protein. No eggs are an egg that comes out of, you know, a chicken's ass. It's like chicken is protein. No, it, it's like the body of a bird that was raised in like brutal conditions, right? Like what, what package is the protein coming in, right? What package is your sugar and your carbs coming in? And like, you know, people based on that same logic will eat less fruit uh, because they think they're getting a lot of sugar, right? And fruit, I believe, is the most health promoting food on the planet. So those words just mislead us into making like ill-informed decisions for our health. Um, and I always encourage people to just throw those words out the window and look at the food as a whole, you know, like what, what is chicken, right? What, what, what is that doing for my body, right? What else is coming with that quote unquote protein? Does that food promote my health or not? Um, and, and that's the question we should be asking. We get so obsessed with like cutting carbs and like increasing protein, um, which doesn't work from a health standpoint. Um, and it, it just makes no sense. You have to look at the food as a whole. Does the apple promote my health or does it not? Like you shouldn't be asking the grams of sugar and carbs in an apple. Like that promotes your health. And, um, you know, that's very different than eating an Oreo or, you know, drinking Coca-Cola. Like that, that's a different food as a whole. So, yeah, uh, long story short, those words just blind us to making um, the healthy decision. And I think they're just probably the most destructive words we have, um, you know, concocted in the world of human health. Yeah. Fuck the macros. <laughs> Fuck the macros, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, your, your fruit before noon thing. Did you get that from um, a book? Jesse Eitzler talked about some, some book he read forever ago. I'm wondering if that's like the same book. Um, I definitely heard fruit from new fruit before nude from Jesse. Um, I more so these days just won't, again, unless I'm like uh, doing like a, a really long workout, like I don't generally eat till the afternoon these days. Yeah. Um, I just like to, but the, the whole idea with the morning is just to like get out of the body's way, 
like, you know, let your digestion happen. Like, you know, just, just try to aid your body, not hinder your body uh, yeah. the best you can. And I think fruit is a great way to do that if you are going to eat um, or, or just like liquids in general. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks Pat for taking time out of your, your day. That means a lot to me. Um, where, where should, uh, people go after they listen to this to consume more of you and your world? Yeah. Uh, eat green, make green, just about every, everywhere on Instagram, TikTok, eatgreenmakegreen.com. Um, I do a podcast as well that I've done for years now. Um, yeah. And then if you're in Boston, plantpub.com, come have a beer and a burger, uh, if that's new to you. Um, and yeah, always open to talking with people and responding to people and doing whatever I can to help people. Love it. Thanks so much, man. Thank you, man. So awesome. I'm, uh, we're, I, I, I hope know. that was all right. No, I think that was great. We're going to Boston sometime. One of my best friends lives there.